Food. People talk about it nonstop and, in fact, spend many times hours, more time thinking about food than eating the food. Sometimes because their lust for food, sometimes because of their simply desire to be healthy. But the Ramban has been taking us on a journey to use food in order to serve God. In fact, tonight he's going to teach us of how we can elevate ourselves, both physically and spiritually, through food. Not food that's hard to grab and buy, but rather the stuff that's easily accessible to you. The Ramban is teaching us that this food can elevate you spiritually and in fact help you achieve holy Jewish intimacy. Aside from all of this, we have the knowledge now from the Ramban to answer the question that perhaps many of us never even thought about. Why do we love babies so much? Babies are cute, but they're born loved for an unexplainable reason, or at least until now. Why are they loved so much? They haven't done anything. and In fact, every mother knows that they're going to cause her to sleep less and sometimes not sleep, clean more, and sometimes not the fun stuff. Feed, cry. Why do you love them? Why do we make more of them? In fact, one of the most critical parts of the lecture is the answer to that question and how it connects to food, spiritual health, physical health, and Jewish intimacy. Enjoy the lecture, share it, subscribe if you already haven't, and most importantly, remember, we're here to be holy. We are back here on our Tuesday night Jewish Intimacy Series, a series that has certainly transformed many lives uh, from simply the perspective of what intimacy is really all about, uh, from the uh, Torah perspective. This uh, shiur tonight is going to address some new things, things that uh, we've covered slightly before, but more details tonight. Tonight's shiur is going to be for the Refua Shlema for uh, Rabbanit uh, Sara Bat Anat, Rav Ephraim Ben Shulamit, uh, Rabbanit Levana Bat Sara, uh, Avi Mori David Ben Esriya, Imi Morati Doris Bat Jora, and for the Atzlacha Rabba, the success and the good health of all of the righteous uh, people that are uh, watching us, people that are trying to get closer to Hashem, whether a Jew or Gentile, anyone that's looking to get closer to Hashem is a good friend of ours. So, with that being said, just a reminder to everybody, the uh, Key Roof Store, where we you know, send out a bunch of stuff uh, for free to anyone that wants to distribute to their uh, communities. Uh, Baruch Hashem is uh, busier than ever. Uh, we've run out of uh, a bunch of things over the last uh, 24 hours, but uh, there's still some stuff left. There's still some USBs. There's still some copies of my book. Uh, and there's a m bunch of stuff on the way that's actually on the ship, and Bezat Hashem will be here in the uh, coming weeks, uh, but uh, anyone that wants to get some stuff for their community, go to the uh, kiruvstore.org. Kiruvstore.org is K-I-R-U-V-S-T-O-R-E.org, and you can get some stuff for free over there to distribute in your community. Uh, Baruch Hashem, uh, all of the shipments that uh, for the orders that were made up to today have actually been shipped. Uh, as of right now. So everything has been shipped. If you've ordered something in the last few days, in the last couple of weeks, everything has been shipped in the last 24 hours. So you should be getting it uh, within literally days. And many shipments we sent out even overnight if they were uh, uh, ordered a couple of weeks ago and there's been a delay. So Bezat Hashem, you'll get them this week. So with that being said, we're going to continue our series, our series of the uh, uh, Jewish intimacy has certainly uh, been covering different grounds, things that really most people uh, have, not, um, have not really expected to be part of Jewish intimacy. I mean, generally speaking, when somebody thinks about Jewish intimacy, they're thinking the act itself. Perhaps, you know, if they're looking to achieve holiness, there may be some spiritual preparation. But as we've seen, Jewish intimacy covers all aspects of the person's life. And in fact, the, the one part of a person's body that is the foundation for his entire body and his soul is the brit, is the uh, uh, sex organs. Uh, so the, uh, uh, and in Hebrew, it's called erva. And the truth is that in uh, the holy language, there is no word for the male or the female uh, sex organ. The, uh, the word that they use is erva, which literally means nakedness. And one of the reasons for that is the Gemara in Masechet Psachim at the first chapter says 
A person needs to know how to use clean language. Clean language, and of course, HaKadosh Baruch Hu leads us by example by using clean language where there's literally no word for these uh, uh, parts of the body that unfortunately every uh, six or seven year old that's uneducated in Torah has at least four or five uh, synonyms for. Needless to say, Jewish intimacy is something that requires spiritual preparation, mental preparation, physical preparation, but in the last couple of weeks, we've seen that it also requires a specific diet. If you want to achieve the uh, the best part, you know, the best part of Jewish intimacy, you're going to have to do your best to take a piece of every one of these. You can't just say, okay, listen, you know what, the physical part, I'm good, but everything else, you know, is out the window. You have to do your best with whatever you can do and little by little build on it. If you can't do anything, fine, at least try. Try with something because no one gets punished for simply trying. What you do get punished for is if you don't try, you simply give up on yourself. So, one of the beautiful things that uh, we see in the, uh, in the Jewish language, in the Hebrew, the Svata Kodesh, is that every word has a significant meaning, not only as far as uh, telling you what it is, but telling you its essence. And the Brit is, is, called, is the foundation. The Brit is not only the covenant between us and God, but it's also called the Yesod, the, the, the foundation, the foundation of the uh, spiritual realm of a person, as well as the physical realm. And when a person wants to serve a Kadosh Baruch Hu, whether it's a he or a she, and they want to serve Hashem at the highest possible level that you can, they need to take all of this into consideration because the ultimate covenant between you and your Creator begins and ends with the foundation. Of course, all of the other things, whether you eat uh, specific foods and you pray and you learn, all of those other things certainly play a role in it and they certainly uh, help you or deter you from, from doing what you're supposed to do. But if a person is particular about sanctifying themselves through morality, through their, their intimacy, certainly this is a person that can achieve great heights much more than the average person can. But the Ramban is not talking about simply the, the act itself, things that uh, you know we would naturally expect. In fact, the Ramban is teaching us that we need to prepare ourselves even through our food. And one of the questions that uh, we really are going to achieve uh, and, and attaining at least somewhat of an answer for is not only the connection of all of these beautiful parts of your life and, and, and seeing how the Torah connects all of them, but also something that perhaps maybe some of you have asked, maybe some of you haven't asked, but a, a question that seems really unrelated, which is why are babies born loved? Every baby, if their mother is normal and you know mentally healthy, uh, is loved immediately before they do anything, before they've said anything, before they've promised anything. And there's actually a lot that goes into it because the mother knows that she just sacrificed her life, her body, her beauty for this baby. And what is she going to get in return? Well, she's going to have to change him multiple times a day. She's going to have to feed him because if not, he's simply going to drive her crazy from crying. He's going to keep her up at night and most likely wake her up many nights. And uh, aside from eating, you know, filling out the, uh, the, the diaper a few times and crying, you're not really going to uh, get so much out of this baby. But yet, the baby is loved. And in fact, if the baby has normal parents, they're loved by both parents, not just the mother. Now, you could say that the mother loving the baby, that's perhaps because he, you know, he came from her body. Fine. But what about the father? What did he do for it? This too is relevant, and this too is going to be addressed in the lecture tonight, Bezal Hashem. So the Ramban has really been addressing this diet in a, uh, a very interesting way where he's actually first and foremost told us that there are certain things that uh, a person has to be careful of. As the Rambam says, Maimonides says that in uh, Ilchot Deot, that a person that is careful with what he consumes, what he eats, is going to live a healthy life, which includes the intimate aspects of life. Uh, you know, and one of the things that uh, you see as people age 
is many times they lose their ability to be as intimate, to be as passionate, to be as active all in, in general. And what the Ramban is actually telling us is that this has everything to do with their diet. Not necessarily with their weight, not even necessarily with, a, uh, with their culture, but with their diet per se. And if a person pays careful attention at some of the things we're going to review tonight, certainly they'll be praiseworthy for it and happy for it as well. Now, on the other hand, there are always going to be people that assume they already know everything. Perhaps because they attest to their knowledge through results. They have several kids and the kids are normal and uh, decent human beings. So they figure I already know everything. The Ramban is surprising us every single week. And one of the things we know from the Torah is that afokhba ve'afokhba de kulaba. Delve into it and delve into it because everything is in it. And you certainly do not know everything. But sometimes the arrogance within a person will make him think that he knows everything. So much so that even when there is an outright rebuke by the sages, they won't even realize it's about them. It's similar to a joke that uh, is really something that happened uh, that I heard from our own dear Rabbi Ephraim, where years ago, the Stipler Gaon uh, walked into the Bet Midrash, and it was Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur, the day of repentance, the day where we're all uh, not only obligated to do tshuva, but it's a uh, really the, uh, you know, something uh, that's the, uh, supposed to be the top on their mind, is to do tshuva, to, uh, to uh, fix ourselves, to promise to fix ourselves, and everyone is afraid to make any mistake. Needless to say, to rebuke somebody uh, unless they're 100% certain that this rebuke is just. But on that day, on that Yom Kippur, as soon as the Stipler Gaon walked into the Bet Midrash and he saw a couple of Bachurim, he looked at one of them and he started rebuking him in front of everybody. Telling him, aren't you ashamed of yourself to act this way? Aren't you embarrassed? To be a Talmit Chacham that acts this way, that does these things, you should be ashamed of yourself. Such a Talmit Chacham has to act much better than you. And the stipler walks away. Now, of course, if this wasn't a rebuke that was needed, then the stipler would have never done it because we all know from Sefer Bereshit, from the book of Genesis, we learned from Tamar, it's better to jump into a fire than to embarrass somebody in public. So certainly the stipler knows this and knew this and did it regardless. Now you would think that this Bahu would cry, do tshuva, fix himself. But he didn't. He smiled. When his friend looked at him smiling or having the smirk on his face, he says, Aren't you embarrassed right now that the Gdola Do, the biggest rabbi of the generation, just rebuked you and ripped you apart for what you did? And he looks at him, he says, What are you talking about? The Gdola Do, the Stipe Lagon, just called me a Talmit Chacham. Isn't that something? It's like, yeah, but he told you you're doing terrible. Yeah, but he called me Talmit Chacham. He told me a Torah scholar. Isn't that something? Isn't that a positive way to look at it? Now, of course, you can say it's a positive way to look at it and we can institute you also because there is no positive way of looking at it. A person needs to know when there is a rebuke that is directed at you, which means that Hashem made sure that you heard it and therefore it has something to do with you, whether you agree to it or not, a person needs to take that into account because there are literally billions of people in the world that can be hearing these words of the living God but God chose you to be the one that hears them. Hence the reason why every one of the words of the sages are things we have to take into account. Now, and not be delusional. Now the Ramban completed the last part or last lecture, letting us know that there are foods that certainly help us, foods that hurt us, but most importantly, the main thing that was achieved in last week's lecture is to understand that when you are eating food, you are not part of a holocaust. Holocaust of chickens, holocaust of cows, holocaust of the 
vegan mentality that's in the world today where people think, no, it's not right to eat meat, it's not right to eat chicken, it's not right to eat all of this. And the Ramban covered this issue extensively, explaining to us that according to the Torah, every single time you eat, whether it be a chicken or be a piece of meat for some uh, kosher animal, whatever you're consuming, you're do- if you're doing it right, you're doing it a favor. You're doing it a service because you're elevating it. Now, if a person acts like a beast and simply eats without blessing, eats without purpose, eats without an end, then certainly it's better off that they don't eat. But if a person is already understanding that the the mentality of today, unfortunately, the liberal, woke type of mind, lefty liberal mindset has really affected every part of our belief system and we have to address these issues even when it has to do with something so sensitive like the relationship between a husband and wife a relationship that almost seems like it was from the previous generation now the Ramban continues giving us more details on the tips the tips that helped great tzaddikim like the shach great tzaddikim like the divrei chaim sanctify themselves to the point where they're able to levitate, to fly in the air. And this is not three, four, five thousand years ago. This is over the last couple of hundred years. Meaning that if a person takes some of these items to account, they could literally get themselves to a greater level than they can possibly imagine. Perhaps they're not going to get to, uh, uh, maybe they will, they're not going to get to a usually to a point of levitating over the uh, the earth, but at the very least, they could know that it is possible to get better through these, what seems to be simple things. Now, the Gemara says that sound is good for incense. As we uh, say in the Pitum um, Aktoret, uh, the, the, the sound is good for the besamim, for, the, uh, uh, for, for these incense, different types of uh, incense that are out there. On the other hand, the same Gemara says that uh, sound is bad for uh, uh, or hurts uh, the quality of wine. The quality of wine. So from there we see that these things we consume are living. Whether it's a cow, a chicken, a fish, or it's a plant. Everything is living. But just because it's living doesn't mean we cannot consume it. In fact, it's the opposite. If you are a human being, it was created for you. If you are able to use it to elevate yourself and serve your creator, even more so. So, sound is good for certain incense. Sound is bad for wine. This is the reason why there's wine cellars are typically... Uh, in uh, very quiet places, they're underground. Uh, generally speaking, you'll see that uh, typically uh, women are not uh, are not uh, common employees in the business, or at least not the ones where they go and deal with the wine itself. Uh, in in some of the uh, uh, higher end uh, wines, this is not because they are uh, uh, sexist or they hate women, but simply because there is an impact. There's a known no impact that comes from women that does not come from men. Now, of course, the uh, uh, these types of things are just small little tidbits of the creation around us. And now the Ramban is going to give us a little more details. And he says, after that introduction, know that since the blood is sustenance for the body and the blood becomes the body itself, and that the blood is in accordance to the nature of the food from which it's built, it is important for you to know that if one's food is coarse and impure, then the blood will be coarse and impure. And if the food is clean and pure, then the blood will be clean and pure like it. And therefore the Holy One, blessed be He, separated us by his by way of His Holy Torah from several forbidden foods. Right off the bat... The Ramban is telling us, after I've given you the introduction about food and why you need to use the creation in order to elevate yourself, 
Now I'm going to tell you how it elevates you, not the creation, because the creation we've already covered. Everything you eat turns into blood, whether it's ice cream or it's a piece of meat or it's a banana, whatever you consume will eventually turn into blood. And in fact, this is a critical part of information that if you take that into account, it makes everything else that follows easier. Because the Ramban is telling us that now that you know that everything that you eat turns into blood, if you can keep it in the frontal lobe of your memory bank rather than your uh, subconscious, that means that you are going to constantly think about what you're eating before you eat it, why you're eating in the first place, and when you're eating. Because everything you eat is going to turn into you. Now, I know that there's a famous statement, you are what you eat, but this is going a step further. He's telling you that this blood will become the body itself. And if the blood that you're creating is coming from dirty food, what they call junk food, what they call food that is simply unhealthy, then the blood that you will create will also be impure, coarse, and simply problematic, not only on a physical level, but even more so on a spiritual level. Now, how this affects intimacy, we're going to get to. But he's telling you now that if you eat good food, food that is recommended not only by your local dietitian and, and some uh, local vitamin store, but by the Torah itself, then that food is going to create pure blood, blood that is clean, blood that will be just like the food. And part of the reason of why God created the Torah with kosher laws, part of it, not all of it, but part of the reason was because this is part of the ways that we could attain holiness. By having things that are pure, consumed we are turning our physical self into something pure into something better than what we were beforehand by consuming things that are impure things that are disgusting to the in the eyes of god things that are uh violent things that are a uh, uh, uh smell terrible or things that are simply considered a abomination in the eyes of god this turns us into that as well both on a physical and a spiritual level. Now, he says there are some of them which stupefy the heart, such as the hard fats and the blood. So now he's giving us details. He said there are some types of food that is going to make you spiritually stupid. As it says in Sefer Vayikra, when it talks about the laws of of forbidden foods, forbidden animals, we're not allowed to eat. God tells us, which literally means, and you will become impurified because of these forbidden foods if you consume them. The sages say, if you notice, the word is spelled the same exact way as which means you become spiritually stupid, which doesn't mean a person becomes dumb as far as they're not able to uh, achieve uh, great uh, heights in mathematics, in archaeology, in science, in history. No, but rather they become what's called a tomb, closed. Their heart is closed to spirituality, to truth, to the words of the living God. So there are specific foods that cause this. There are some, the Ramban says, such as the predatory animals, predatory birds and beasts, which make a man arrogant and brazen. You can test this to yourself. And surely you know some people in your life that are eating non-kosher food, but not just a typical non-kosher food where they're just buying themselves a non-kosher cow or non-kosher fish, but typically you'll see that the more arrogant the person is, the more they're into 
animals that are actually aggressive themselves. Animals that are aggressive. Animals that are simply not your, you know, docile type of cow. They want something more. Even if it's once in a blue moon, but they're interested in it. They eat it. They like it. Aggressive fish, aggressive birds, aggressive beasts. These types of creations make a person arrogant and brazen. There are some which close the doors of intelligence and understanding, such as the hare, the rabbit, and the pig, the reptiles, the snake, and the insects. These types of animals typically are consumed by people that are not Jewish, but needless to say, it's people that uh, Jews that don't observe Torah and mitzvot and travel to different foreign lands, to Thailand, to different parts of Asia. Uh, they try all types of things, and in fact, uh, many times their evil inclination entices them to the uh, things that are the most forbidden. And these types of things, like the rabbit, the hare, the pig, the uh, the reptiles, the snakes, and the insects, while a religious Jew immediately cringes when he hears these things, the average non-religious Jew doesn't see a problem. To eat a uh, bacon, egg, and cheese type of sandwich doesn't see a problem. Sometimes they eat it for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. If they travel to a land where that offers a, uh, uh, these types of reptiles, or they go to different parts of the United States, where it's the custom over there to eat these types of things in the South and uh, different parts of uh, Florida and Texas and uh, other parts of the country, they have no problem eating an iguana, no problem eating a snake. These types of foods not only affect the body itself physically, but the Ramban is telling you is also affecting their spiritual self. And they actually stupefy the person. They stupefy the person. But here he's not talking about stupefy them in the same way that we talked about before where they're close-minded to Torah. That's already a given. Here he's saying these foods actually make the person less competent. Their IQ drops. It would be wonderful to uh, see if there's ever been any studies done on these things on a scientific level. Not that we need science to agree with the sages, but the point is, is that the, the, this uh, generation always likes uh, more facts, more information. There are also some foods which bring all kinds of evil and difficult diseases, such as the vermin of the earth and the sea. Here he's talking about shellfish. He's talking about the, uh, uh, all of the fish, the fruits of the sea, they call it. Lobsters. The, uh, uh, all of these cockroaches that they uh, call shellfish or all types of seafood is not only forbidden according to the Torah, but it's, the Torah calls them an abomination. The Torah calls them vermin. Now anyone that's ever looked at a close-up picture of a cockroach and a lobster, you'll see that there's Quite a few similarities between the two. Those similarities are not a coincidence. One is a cockroach of the land. The other one is a cockroach of the sea. One is a vermin of the land. One is a vermin of the sea. These are different creatures that Hashem created in order to clean the earth. Not to be consumed by the earth. Not to be consumed by people. And although the non-Jews are allowed to eat these lobsters and shellfish. There's no problem with them eating them as far as the Torah is concerned. The Ramban is warning us that it's still a terrible idea to do so because they create all types of evil and difficult diseases, meaning that shellfish, the, all of the different varieties of it, are not only going to hurt a person spiritually and create all types of evil in their mind you know thoughts that are inappropriate but also disease physical disease we see that the bigger commerce becomes the more new diseases are in the earth 
Today, they're fishing so much out of the ocean, so many lobsters and different types of fish and different types of creatures from the sea without thinking twice that a, uh, a fisherman, maybe for 60 years, recently told me that uh, there are many new barriers to entry for, for a lot of the things that used to be standard, where you used to go to certain places to fish and you were able to take a few home. Today, in many places, you either can't take anything home at all or whatever you can take home is so rare that most likely you're simply not going to catch it because it has to be within a specific size and that's usually not common for that fish. So there's so much fishing going on that the laws of the land are restraining it. Now, of course, there's still people that are breaking the law, but the point being is, is that you see that we're consuming a lot. People are consuming a lot. Kadosh Baruch Hu is constantly giving us more and more options. But yet, people are choosing to consume the things that are terrible for them because they don't put that much thought behind what they're eating and why they're eating it. They're living to eat instead of eating to live. The Ramban is telling us, if you've noticed that the number of different diseases in the world has increased as the availability of these creatures has increased, that is not a coincidence. Because these creatures are the vermin of the earth and the sea, and they bring all types of difficult diseases. In conclusion... Regarding all of this, the Torah has said in Leviticus chapter 11, verse 43, you will not make your souls detestable. And thusly Hashem notified that thereby all of these things are abominable, despicable. And they produce coarse blood, which is ready for exposure to all kinds of danger and make the body and spirit despicable. So here you can see that although there is certain laws that only Jewish people have, and certainly this applies 100% to Jewish people and warning them, there are certain benefits for the non-Jews also to apply here. Because the non-Jew also wants to be healthy and not have these evil diseases, not have a diet of vermin, and even more so, just as the Jew wants to create pure blood, so does the Gentile. So later on in this Igeret, not today, but in probably uh, maybe another month or so of lectures, the Ramban actually mentions Noahides. And he actually specifically says that much of this is for both Jews and Gentiles. And in fact, the food aspect of it more than anything else, because even though the Gentiles are not obligated to eat kosher food, and there isn't necessarily as uh, anywhere near as much spiritual benefit for, for a Gentile to eat kosher food, we see here that it's not that eating kosher food is going to improve the spirituality, but rather that the non-kosher food is hurting it, both physically and spiritually, especially if it's these particular animals. If you're eating rabbits, you're eating pig, you're eating all of these vermin, these cockroaches of the, of, of the earth and the sea, it is not doing you any good. If you're finding yourself having a difficult time with modesty, with different character traits, whether it's arrogance, stinginess, things of that nature, fix your diet and you'll have an easier time fixing your life. Now, this being so, the Ramban is now giving us this warning about this food. Where else can we see this type of information? As we saw from the last couple of paragraphs in last week's Shul, that the Ramban is telling us that everything, you know, there's multiple different levels in creation, the foundations of creation, the fire, the water, the um, uh, wind, the ruach, uh, and the afar, 
the, uh, the earth. Everything is made up of, of part of it. Uh, certain things are made up of multiple parts of it. The fish are made up of water. The animals are made up of uh, the earth. Birds are made up of a combination of water and earth. The less earthy a person is, the, uh, the more they'll uh, be uh, sp- spiritually and physically elevated. A person that is lethargic is because they, uh, they have more of the impact of earth uh, uh, affecting them. A person that's more hyperactive has more fire affecting them. And all of the things that we have in creation, whether it be the, uh, uh, the, the minerals, the plants... The, the, the animals and the, uh, uh, the people, each one to elevate itself by being consumed. The mineral is consumed by the plant and the mineral is gone from the earth. The plant is consumed by the animal and thereby the, an- the, the uh, plant is gone from the earth. It elevated itself to now becoming part of the animal, but it also ceased from existence of their previous existence. Same with the animal, elevating itself to be part of the human, and thereby ceased from existence. Everything that gives life to something that's higher than it is consumed and loses its form. The mineral gave life to the plant, but in the process, it lost its form. It elevated itself, it gave life to the plant, but it's gone from the earth. The plant gave life to the animal, elevated itself to become part of the animal, but also lost its form. The animal gave life to the person, elevated itself, became part of the person, but lost its form. All of the things that give life to something else lose form, except a human being. Where a woman gives birth to a child, but the woman stays the same. Perhaps our body's a little different, requires some recovery, but she stays a human being. In fact, many times, women that continue to get pregnant and not uh, try to uh, preserve their body to be a uh, a, a twig that uh, just, uh, you know, uh, achieved adulthood, women that continue to bring more children to the world actually uh, keep their youth much more than women that try to preserve their youth and not by not having kids. If you see, for example, you know, religious women that had 10, 12 kids, they're in their 40s. They look many times like they're in their 20s or early 30s. On the other hand, you see some of these uh, uh, Hollywood type of personalities that have one kid and three dogs. As soon as they hit their 40s, they already have to run to the surgeon on a weekly basis sometimes just to make sure that the fake mask doesn't fall off because their real self looks terrible. They age horribly. So creating life, instead of losing form, the woman actually gains youth. And this is a common thing. Now, the Gemara in Masechet Gitin, on page 7a, brings us a little bit more information. The Gemara says that a person needs to be, in the name of Rabbi Abau, a person has to be careful not to instill excessive fear in his household. Not to be like a scary father or a scary boss where everybody's scared of you so much that they're scared of your shadow. They hear your, uh, your coming, they run away. Why? It says because such fear leads to major problems for a great man once instilled excessive fear in his household and because of their fear of him they fed him forbidden food 
And who is this great man? Rabbi Hanina ben Gamliel. What's the story? The people that worked at the house of Rabbi Hanina ben Gamliel, he was wealthy, and he had people work for him. And part of their job was to make sure that he his food, to take care of his food. Now he had a uh, leg of an animal, kosher animal, that he bought from the uh, butcher, and uh, it was time to eat it. They knew that he, this is what he wanted that day. They knew this was the day to eat it. It's not like today where you can refrigerate things forever. Back then they would uh, preserve things with salt, but it was a very, very different process. But needless to say, the day came and the people that managed it could not find this leg. They couldn't find it. This huge piece of meat gone from the earth as if the ground swallowed it. Now they were so scared of Rabbi Hanna ben Gamliel to tell him such a thing that as soon as he got home and they knew that they're out of time, they knew that if they run to the store to go get it, it's going to take a while, maybe even hours. It's not like there's just a, like today there's refrigeration and you could just simply have these huge pieces of meat just hanging out there for a few days until somebody buys them. Even today when they, you know, sell meat, usually they uh, cut up and put in the uh, uh, lower level of refrigeration the stuff that they expect to sell that day. Anything they don't expect to sell that day, they leave frozen. Now, these servants in his house were so scared of him that they knew that as soon as they're gone for a couple of hours and there's no food, he's going to know and they're in trouble. What do they do? Because of this fear, they went to the back of the house, which had some uh, cattle there. Without slaughtering the cow, they simply chopped off its leg and tried to cook it and feed it to the rabbi. So the Gemara says, do you really think they fed him this prohibited food? Well, we know that the righteous people are protected by God from any mishap that happens to them. So rather, they tried. What's the really happened, they said, is that they tried to feed him this food, but they couldn't do it. Why? He figured it out. Because a Jew, as well as a Gentile, is not allowed to eat a piece of an animal while it's still alive. Needless to say, a Jew has to eat an animal after it's been slaughtered in a kosher way, then the blood has been removed, it was salted. There's a whole process of koshering an animal. Here, they were so scared of Rabbi Chalina ben Gamliel that they lost their minds and simply just figured, let's just give him something. So this is a, uh, a lesson not to instill fear in the house. But for our purposes, we're going to learn something else here. The Gemara is saying that there is special protection from heaven for righteous people, for tzaddikim. If you look at the Tosfot, in the name of Rabbeinu Tam, on this Gemara, the Tosfot says that when the Torah discusses special protection for the righteous people, this is exactly what it's talking about. This is exactly what it's talking about. It's not necessarily talking about where it's protection from every bad person in the world is not going to affect this guy. No, sometimes bad people hurt even righteous people. It's not going to affect this person where they never lose money. No, sometimes they lose money. So what is this protection? Rabbein Utam says, this is the protection. A mishap that's beyond their control, specifically when it comes to non-kosher food. Why non-kosher food? Why non-kosher food? Says Rabbein Utam, because non-kosher food is a very big damage to the righteous people since it's going to turn into blood. It's going to turn into them and thereby turn the righteous person into something wicked, into something that's not good. So God protects them because this is beyond their ability. So he protects them from these things. 
later on in the Gemara is a side note, something that also has to do with food, not necessarily the same topic, but also in the same page, we're also going to say it, take the opportunity to say it. Rabbi Vira expounded that what is the meaning of the uh, verse by the prophet Nahum in chapter 1, verse 12, where he says, Thus says Hashem, though they are united and likewise and likewise many, even so they shall be shorn off, and it shall pass away. Ravavira says, this is telling us that if a person sees that his provisions, meaning his money, his food, is measured exactly to his needs, meaning he only has just enough to survive. He only has just enough to eat. There's no excess. There's no extra. You cooked food for Shabbat, and literally until the last pea, that's all you had. Usually everybody has leftover food for Shabbat. It's not that you want to waste. It's that sometimes there's such abundance that people are not necessarily as careful. That abundance is a blessing. That abundance is a blessing. Now, don't just cook extra food for no reason and be wasteful, but the point is that abundance is a blessing. If you see that you don't have any abundance, the amount of money that you're making every month is barely enough to pay the bills and sometimes not even. The amount of food that you have in your house is barely enough to get everybody to you know, sleep w- w- without an empty stomach. What do you do when such a situation happens? Rav Avira says, this verse is telling us, if you see that you have your provisions are measured exactly to your needs, he should take from them and give tzedakah. What? Give tzedakah, the Chachamim ask. What do you mean? You're saying he barely has enough to make ends meet. So if he gives tzedakah, I'll have even less. How does that make any sense? Because the Gemara in Masechet Beitzah, page 16, and also Masechet Rosh Hashanah, also page 16, both 16a, 16b. Two tractates say the same exact thing. Akadosh Baruch Hu decides what he's going to give you, how much money he's going to give you already on Rosh Hashanah. How he's going to give it to you determined, is, based, is decided on a, reg, on a day-to-day basis, according to the Mishnah. But how much he's going to give you is already decided on Rosh Hashanah. Now, how much you will keep, which means the blessing part, that has to do with your actions. That has to do with your merits. A person can make a million dollars a year, but still go home with a loss. As you can see in the stock market, year after year, there are always companies that literally make hundreds of millions of dollars in revenues, but they lose billions. Now, to the average person that's not familiar with the market, it doesn't make any sense. How did you make $500 million in sales and you lost $600 million? Like, isn't it better off just not to sell anything? At least you won't lose? No, it doesn't work that way. Sometimes there's certain expenditures that are necessary in order to generate the higher revenue down the road, but that doesn't necessarily always work. It all depends on who's managing the company. But the point being is that somebody can make, an individual can make a fortune, but all of his money... He's gone to places he doesn't want to go. It goes to taxes. It goes to medical bills. It goes to lawsuits. It goes to problems. There's no joy. There's no blessing in the money. He got the blessing where God already decided he's going to give him a lot of money. But there's no blessing as far as how he's getting it and how much he's keeping. Many times, I have different people that tell me, listen, the... Business that I, if they have makes hundred thousand, two hundred thousand dollars a month, and I always, I never ask people for tzedakah, but oh Hashem, I trust Hashem a hundred percent that He's going to send whoever has the merit. But I always wonder how it's very common that the average person that you know makes a decent living doesn't make millions, doesn't even make hundreds of thousands, but decent living typically donate much more money than the people that are making millions. Why? Because typically the people that make millions, they don't necessarily have the blessing to keep most of it. They generate a lot, they give a lot to feed others, but for themselves, they don't necessarily have much to keep. 
they're wasteful with different things that are not necessary. This is obviously not everyone. But the point being is, is that many times I hear some of these people tell me, it's like, oh yeah, I made this and I did this last year. I sold a million and a half and it did and all these big numbers. And obviously I, I lived in this world and none of it impresses me. But it's always interesting to me that typically the people that talk about a lot of money usually donate either nothing or the least. You know, the guy is like proud of his $100 donation. He told me that he just uh, made a million and a half dollars last year. And, uh, you know, he's looking to uh, be a, a big uh, a supporter of the world of Torah. What was the support after 12 months? Maybe $100. Whereas average kid makes, I don't know, a few hundred dollars a week working full-time job. Donates the same amount of money, if not more, per week. How so? Simple. The kid has more blessing. The kid has more blessing. So what if a person has an income, but the income they make, whether it's a lot of money or it's whatever they have, it's simply not enough to pay their bills. Says the Gemara, you're missing on the blessing. You want a blessing? Give tzedakah. Why give tzedakah? Because the tzedakah, the charity, if you support Torah, you support Kiruv, you support people that are actually helping people eat, guess what? That's going to give you the merit. If you think, I'm going to give when I have a lot more, that means you believe that you're making it. And therefore, Hashem says, okay, you think you're making it? Go ahead, make it on your own. But if you're recognizing that the Creator is the one that's making it, the Creator is the one that's giving it to you. The Creator is the one that's deciding how much of it you're going to end up keeping. He's deciding what the blessing is. You're going to say, okay, you know what, God? You're the one that runs the world. You're the one that gave me everything. You know what? Instead of giving $10 a month, I'm going to give $50 a month. I'm going to give $100 a month. Not saying go broke and don't pay your rent. But the Gemara says, if you see that you don't have any blessings in your money, you don't have any blessings in your food, Give more charity and you'll see more blessings. What you're missing is not income. What you're missing is a blessing. Now, the Chachamim talk about food in different ways. Here we saw that the Tosfot, in the name of Rabbeinu Tam, which was one of the Tosfot, saying that the Tzadikim are protected, are protected from eating forbidden foods. Where else can we see this in a Torah? The Sefer Daniel, the prophet Daniel, is a section at the beginning of the book of Daniel in chapter 1, where after Nebuchadnezzar, Imach Shimo, who the Midrash says was actually a Jew, and a grandson, some even say a son of King Solomon, but he was obviously an evil monster and a LGBTQ uh, polar boy, or, or, or what is it called? A, uh, whatever, their, 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 their idol. As he would rape all of the kings. This Nebuchadnezzar, after destroying the Bet Migdash, he enslaved hundreds of thousands of Jews, brought them to Babylon. And he took the children that were the most beautiful, that were the most clever, that stood out as a separate section for himself. In addition to having a bunch of slaves everywhere, he took the most beautiful separately. Daniel uh, was one of them and him and his three tzaddikim friends, Chania, Mishael, Nazaria, were in a predicament. After surviving this horrible destruction, this horrible famine, this hunger, now this Nebuchadnezzar, his number one goal is to make sure these people become even more beautiful. So he has them taken care of where they have to eat specific food, all of the meats and, and, and a lot of food to fatten them up and to make them beautiful, to make them healthy. And the prophet Daniel 
says, no way. I'm not doing it. But if you say no, the same is going to kill you. So in chapter 1, verse 8, it says, V'yasem Daniel al libo, asher lo yitgael bepatgab, bepatbag, amelech ubiyayin mishtav, v'yivakesh misar asarisim, asher lo yitgael. Daniel set to resolve, meaning he made up his mind in his heart, not to be defiled by the king's food, nor by his drinking wine. So he requested from the chief officer, who was a eunuch, that he not be defiled. Why is it the, the, the uh, why is it important to know that the chief officer was a saris, was a eunuch? Because these were beautiful kids, and if they weren't, they would rape them. So Nebuchadnezzar made sure that no one else has the permission to do the evil that he does. Anyway, Daniel did not want to eat his food. Did not want to eat all this meat. Did not want to eat all of these animals that he's feeding everybody else. Even though it's going to put his life at risk to simply not eat. Now, initially, Daniel didn't tell his friends. And he simply trusted that Hashem is going to protect him. But this was discovered relatively quickly. And when he was questioned, he had to deal with it. So Daniel told, now he's speaking on behalf of himself and his three friends, Hananiah, Mishael, Nazariah. And he says to the officer that's in charge of them, Please test your servant for 10 days and let them give us pulse and we will eat. What's pulse? Pulse is like raw seeds, rice, peas, beans, things that are, uh, you know, no, there's no issue of, of, of being kosher or not kosher. They're, they're not cooked by, the, uh, by anyone over there. You could eat them raw if you want. And he says, let them feed us this pulse and we will eat and give us water and we will drink. Meaning, don't give us the wine, don't give us the meat, don't give us chicken, don't give us the ham, don't give us anything else. Just give us some rice and give us water. That's it. And we'll eat. Then let our appearance and the appearance of the youth who eat the king's food be seen by you and act towards your servant in accordance to what you see. See, here Daniel is telling them, you're worried that if I don't eat this food that the king commanded, that I'm going to die, I'm going to get sick, my friends are going to get sick. So, give us a test. You take the food, you eat it, we're just going to eat rice. We're just going to eat uh, peas. We're just going to drink water. No wine, nothing else. After 10 days, obviously by then it's going to have an impact on our health. If it's impacting us in a negative way, you're seeing that we're losing weight, we look sickly, anything like that, you're going to easily see it. Why? It's not only you see us every day, but also you have all these other kids. The other kids are going to get healthier and we're going to get sicker. On the other hand, if you see that we're not getting sicker, and in fact, we're even healthier than everybody else. This is not going to require me to convince you. This is simply you're going to see with your own eyes. He heated them in this manner and tested them for 10 days. At the end of 10 days, their appearance seemed better. And they were healthier, flesh than all of the youth eating the king's food. And thereafter, the steward would take away their food to himself and their drinking wine and give them pulse. As for these youths, the four of them, God gave them learning and skill in every script and wisdom, and Daniel understood every kind of vision and dreams. So here we see that as a result of Daniel and his three friends, Chananiah, Mishael, and Nazariah, they not only passed the spiritual test from above, not to eat non-kosher food, even though technically if your life is on the line, you're allowed to eat non-kosher food, you don't have to kill yourself for it, but he knew that he could... Trust in Hashem 
to pass this test, to give him the strength, to give him the ability. And he was willing to sacrifice his life for it. And he not only passed it, but he passed it with flying colors, where as a result of it, he became both physically and spiritually healthier. Where all four of them became wiser as a result of it, had all types of extraordinary, beyond-the-norm knowledge. But Daniel got even an additional special gift where he got prophecy because he was the first one. Now, the Gaonmi Vilna says that this better appearance on verse 15 was a miracle. It's a miracle. Simple. Hashem made a miracle for Daniel and his friends that as a result of them just eating this rice and peas and water, they became now healthier. Certainly a miracle. The Ibn Ezra says, no, there's no need to say that it's a miracle because the verse itself says that they ate rice which is known to purify the blood. Rice purifies the blood and is better than wheat. And this rice is commonly eaten by the people of Hodu. Hodu is another word for India. And when rice is cooked in milk, it is a special food. Not much is needed of it to be satiated, to be full. It's a heavy food, and the grains are are thin and not round. Rice and peas cure the body. They purify the blood. And since Daniel and his friends enjoyed the taste of the food, they enjoyed the rice, that even made a better effect on them. So here the, the Ibn Ezra gives us extraordinary insights on something every single one of us can do. What is it? Eat more rice. And peas. Now some of us come from customs and cultures where rice is pretty much in our diets every day. Others, perhaps maybe once a week, once in a blue moon. But here we see there's, it's no longer a for diet purposes, digestive purposes, that we're going to eat it. No, no, no. Here we see clear instructions from the Ibn Ezra. The reason why Daniel and his friends, the tzaddikim, were elevated physically and spiritually was because of something that's accessible to every single person out there. Rice. And peas, even better. You eat them together, you eat them on a regular basis, it's going to purify your blood. It cures the body. And he says, if you cook it with milk, which I never have, but now that I read this, I'm certainly going to ask the Rabbanit to give it a try. But the point being here is that the Ibn Ezra, hundreds of years ago, tells us there's no miracle that needed to happen for Daniel. The miracle is in the creation itself. The food they consumed in itself is going to purify the blood is going to make you feel better, look better, and so on. Especially since it's the only thing they ate. And they didn't eat anything damaging, such as these cockroaches and pigs and all of the other things that are disgusting and abominable in the eyes of God. So it's not just eat rice, but, you know, put some pig on it. Eat rice and put some, uh, you know, some, uh, I don't know, some eagle on it. No. It's eliminating the bad and consuming more good. And if a person likes to taste, it's even better. That's the extra, that's the extra that I was very surprised to see how detailed the sages are sometimes, where, all the time really, where they told us, listen, rice is good, but what made it even better for them is because they liked it. So what does that mean to us? That means that some people have, you know, they have uh, taste buds that are like, you know, one of these connoisseurs. 
you know, if his wife serves him anything other than a five-star uh, meal, he wants a divorce. You know, they they uh, they have these taste palates, and you know, they're one of these people that you know, you give them some wine, and they start going like this with the wine as if it's playing roulette. And as if they know what they're doing, and then he takes the uh, wine and he looks at it as if it's gonna say something to him, and then he takes a little sip out of the wine and he starts gargling it like it's mouthwash. You know, those types of people, usually those people don't watch my lectures, but if they are, watch the rest because it's gonna help you and stop being like that. It's nonsense. Some of the people are very particular about their food. I understand. Personally, I can't really eat things that I don't like. Not that I won't eat them, I, I don't like it. I don't like it, therefore I don't eat it. Now, Baruch Hashem, I don't have to deal with that type of problem because the Rabbanit is a very good cook. But sometimes, if there's something that, if I am a guest somewhere or something like that, and somebody gives me something and I don't like it, it's not that I say something or anything, it's just that simply I have to figure out a way of how to, you know, finish or, 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 or eliminate the attention to this particular food as much as possible, as quickly as possible, because... I don't like it. Now, this is not very common, but it happens. So I understand. Some people are, are, are particular about everything. Meaning even the things that they like, they like them in a specific way. You know, they want tea, not boiling, but don't burn it. And at the same token, it can't be uh, lukewarm. It has to be somewhere in the middle. Like they, they actually even measured the degrees. You know, they want the rice... Not uh, overly cooked, not too, uh, you know, too much like a, uh, uh, sticking to each other, not too dry, not too this, not too that. By the time you finish, like, oh, Habibi, go cook for yourself. So people like that are trouble. They're trouble. So we can't be that way. Yet, we can't ignore our taste buds. Why? The Ibn Ezra says, if you like it, if you like it, the impact of it will be even better. So now what is a person to do to like it more? Simple. Don't be overly picky, but do whatever it is that you can to make you like it, whether it's adding specific ingredients, whether it's curcumin, or you want to eat whatever other ingredients that people like, different customs, different cultures, different places around the world. But whatever you need, put on there to make it tasty. If you, I don't know, spicy, not spicy, but the point being is, Make sure you like it. Don't just eat like a robot and say, okay, I'm eating, I'm going to be uh, tzaddik because I'm eating this rice that I can't, you know, like as fast as, but no, don't be that way. You know, sometimes there I, 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 uh, I get sent these videos and I remember years ago, somebody sent me a video of a few guys from, uh, you know, so I don't know, that worked at some Asian factory and uh, it was a time for them to eat. And literally, I didn't know what I was watching, whether it was a human being or was animals, because they had these bowls of rice, and they filled them up, and you, the guy's face is like literally almost like kissing the bowl, and he's eating so fast, I, I, it was a, unbelievable, that first of all, stuff like that is gross, and should never be done, but aside from that, don't be that way, meaning don't eat so fast, because you don't like it, try to do whatever you can to like it, whether it's add specific ingredients uh, or add specific, uh, whatever, whatever you need to do. Not because we're eating it for the sake of because it's such a good taste, but rather because the good taste will improve the effect. Will improve the effect. Now, the sages did not shortchange us When it comes to advice about food, there's a sefer I was gifted for one of my students some time ago, and it was uh, by a couple of Talmidei Chachamim, Rav Moshe Cohen Shauli, and also Rabbi Yaakov Fischer. And they have different teachings of the uh, of the Rambam and other Chachamim, I should say, because there's other Chachamim in there as well. Uh, that uh, spoke about specific foods and how they affect their body and, uh, and so on. It's called Nature's Wealth. Health and uh, healing plants based on the teachings of the Rambam. This is what the book looks like. Now, this book, Baruch Hashem, has a lot of interesting things about different foods, people that are very uh, 
uh, health conscious, uh, uh, love this type of writing because it literally gives you all types of interesting things about the benefits of cumin, the benefits of fennel. Like you wouldn't believe how many diseases fennel helps with. Like it's literally like a superfood and all types of other things that are good for you. Now, and why they're good for you, and they bring you the sources of which sage mentioned it, or, 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 or uh, where it's mentioned, when it's good to consume it, how to consume it, all types of interesting things. Anyway, towards the end of the book, they have uh, the uh, different impacts that uh, your diet can have on you. It says the following. Excessive Sexual activity weakens the body. This is exactly what the Rambam says in El Chodeot. It saps man's life essence and drains the body of its essential natural moisture. If a man abruptly ceases sexual activity after many years, his body temperature drops. His movements become heavy, his mind becomes confused, and he may become depressed because of the rancid sperm which accumulates in his body. Four or five days prior to menstruation, a woman should eat easily digested foods and drink honey, which will ease the discharge of the menstrual blood. So here we have three different points that he's mentioned so far. I'm not giving you the numbers. Well, on one end, he's telling you that excessive activity is going to weaken the body. On the other hand, if a person stops abruptly, it's also going to destroy him both spiritually and physically. A woman that's going through the uh, uh, menstruation uh, could uh, uh, help herself uh, deal with certain uh, things by, uh, with her diet as far as the uh, eat food that's easy to digest and drink honey. Then he says three factors will cause a woman who, will neither, who is neither young nor old nor suffering from malnutrition to fail to menstruate. Three factors that will cause a woman to fail to menstruate. Weakness of the uterus and blood vessels. Pain, sores, and infection of the uterus. Blockage of the uterus or blood vessels. Failure to to menstruate for any of these reasons is very harmful to the body. Complete loss of appetite, chills, pains in the hips, head, and and the back of the eyes, passage of reddish urine, the burning sensation when urinating, the leakage of milk from the breast are all early signs of illness. So here he's giving you different things that uh, are referring to your body. Now, where does the food come in? At number 15 he says, foods beneficial to intimacy are lamb, mutton, pigeon meat, the brain, the, especially of hens and pigeons. Uh, rooster testicles increase the production of sperm, as does egg yolk. Number of vegetables and fruits will aid erection and increase production of sperm, including the turnips, lettuce, white onions, fennel, garden mint, peppermint, peas, beans, rubia, lubia, sesame, asparagus, dried almonds, grapes, pistachio nuts. Mead, with a D, is also helpful, and wine is best of all. It lifts the spirit and produces warm, moist blood. The wine is best drunk after eating and after bathing. Cumin, pepper, mustard, lentils, sour foods, and vegetables which cool the body, like lettuce, cucumber, and watermelon, are detrimental to achieving an erection and interfere with production of sperm. Excessive intimacy is harmful to all of the organs, especially the brain. Overindulgence makes one forgetful and slow-witted. It impairs vision, weakens the stomach, and gives one an unpleasant, irritable appearance. So here we see a bunch of foods that are good for intimacy, a bunch of foods that are terrible. And of course, there's a lot more. I'm not going to read you the whole book. Anyone that wants to get it can buy it online. I believe it's not uh, hard to buy this book, but point is, it's wisdom of the sages encompasses all encompasses all aspects of life. People that are sick 
shouldn't run to the doctors. Run to the sages first. See if there's something that they have spoken about that you can apply. Change your eating habit. Change your uh, sleeping habit. Change your spiritual habits. But certainly there are things that a person can do at home on their own without needing an insurance card and a life savings to pay for it. There are certainly things a person can do to improve their life. And the prophets are trying to give us these insights in the verses, but we don't understand without the sages. And the sages are doing us a favor even further by not only clarifying what the prophet said, but breaking it down into real-life day-to-day examples, real-life day-to-day tools that every person, new or veteran to the world of Torah, could apply to their life. Now, of course, everything is easier said than done. But that's why I said at the beginning of the lecture that a person needs to really take something out of every lecture and commit themselves to it. Do something. Once I learned, I can tell you myself, I've always known about curcumin and there was a period of my life where I used to eat curcumin every day. And it helps with digestion and things like that. But I never heard about saffron until this, this, uh, I studied this book. So I went online and I said, oh, well, let's get saffron. Well, you know, saffron is good for this, for that. Fantastic. Let me get saffron. And I find online, it's literally like the most expensive thing I've ever seen in my life. I've never seen anything. It's little tiny little packets. A box of them is $50 because there's only a few places in the world that make this. I said, fine, you know what? Whatever, I'll get it. $50, fine. And ever since then, I have a little uh, glass of it. Usually it's better cold. You know, you make it with hot water, but it's usually better after it cools than when it's warm, at least for my taste. Even though I usually like things hot, but this thing is not the most flavorful. But I don't really know all of the health benefits that it could help. What I do know is that the sages mention it multiple times. And that's enough for me. Sometimes, tamim tiyem Hashem, be complete with Hashem. You don't necessarily need to be a scientist in order to believe that there are certain signs that's certainly factual, certainly necessary, certainly beneficial. You don't need to be a doctor in order to know that there are certain things, parts of, 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 of therapy and health that are necessary and, 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 and uh, uh, conducive to your life and uh, can even save a life. You don't need to be an expert in everything in order to trust it. When it comes to the sages, it's even less so. If the sages said it and a person simply takes it at face value, no harm will come from them. Not necessarily because whatever they said is always effective in, to every single person, but rather because the one that decides whether this chalk will be something to use for drawing and that chalk will be something that's going to be used for a cure to aid you with pain is the same God. And God simply decides whether it's going to help you or it's not going to help you. If you trust His sages, that means you're trusting Him with blind eyes. You're trusting Him with blind faith. You're trusting simply because they said it and not necessarily because you verified everything. And sometimes I find it that the less I verify and investigate the more effective things are. This is not to say that a person should be ignorant by choice, but there's just not enough time to do investigations about everything. Sometimes you hear something is good, just do it. Fennel is good, eat fennel. Pistachios are good, eat pistachios. If it's easy for you to get, if it's affordable, just do it. If rice is good, eat it. You don't have to become a, 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 a you know, a, the best uh, uh, dietitian, experts, and, and, and nutritionists all consult you on, on what you should eat every single day because there are certain things that the sages already said, this is good for you, this is bad for you. Avoid this, run towards this. Now, the Ramban later after this section completes this particular section with the following words. This being so, when our sages said in the Gemara Masechet Nida, page 71a, 
that it's necessary for a man to sanctify himself in the marital union, this holiness depends upon food. It's fitting that a man eats food which are proper and which are balanced between hot and cold and that they are the ones that produce blood which is clear, clean, and pure because that blood is destined to become the drop of seed, the semen. And this, in the future, will be the foundation of the st- and structure of the fetus which will be born from that union. For if the food is bad and coarse, then the drop also will be coarse, filthy and turbid. By this we find that the food which is taken before the union is a causative which determines whether the fetus will be wise or foolish, righteous or wicked. On this, I'm going to talk about two specific points. First and foremost, the Ramban gives us a outright statement that we've heard many times. Be holy. Now, being holy, we've discussed Baruch Hashem many times, you have to understand that holiness comes from morality. The more moral a person is, the more holy they can become. But the foundation of all morality is how they express their own sensuality, their intimacy. The more animalistic they are, the less holy they are. Now, if a person looks at Parashat Kedoshim, and you see the commentary by Rashi and the Ramban over there, they differ slightly, but needless to say, both explain how holiness is impossible without the intimacy being holy. To a certain extent, the holier it is, the holier the person. But here the Ramban gives us something else. And he tells us that holiness is not just be holy through the act. Rather, it's be holy through the preparation. Meaning that use your food in order to attain holiness. The food that you consume in itself can elevate you and your status in a much, much bigger way than we ever thought. In fact, if a person takes the words of the Ramban and the sages into account, they're now going to think about every thing that's in front of them before they eat it, while they eat it, while they're thinking about eating it. Why? Because they're going to think, wait, this food is going to become my blood. What kind of blood will it become? Is this food food that the sages recommended to eat? Is this food that my stomach recommends to eat? Is this food only being eaten because of my stomach and my desires? Or is this food going to be like what Rabbi Ephraim writes in his Achtov Israel in his uh, second volume, where you could literally sanctify all food by simply saying before you eat, I am eating this in order to have the strength to serve my creator. In so many words, he has a whole text of blessing over there. But the point is, is that a person that is eating in order to serve their creator, in order to learn more Torah, in order to do more good things, more mitzvot, sometimes the mitzvah is to work and make a living and so you could you know, pay for tuition, pay for food for the family, uh, you pay for Shabbat, that's also a mitzvah. Sometimes the mitzvah is to learn Torah. Sometimes the mitzvah is to go help somebody that's poor. There are many different mitzvot, but if you're eating in order to be able to do those mitzvot as the primary reason of why you're eating, guess what? Your eating can turn you into someone very holy. But if you're eating just because it's available, just because people eat, just because you're hungry, then you're not taking advantage of one of the easiest things you can possibly do to attain holiness. Because anyone that watched some of the earlier lectures and heard about some of the things that we need to do to prepare ourselves spiritually in order for intimacy to be really holy knows that some of these things are very hard and far away from us. But food isn't. To achieve holiness through food 
is certainly possible by more people than you can imagine. We simply have to stop being animals and eat just because we want to eat. Drink just because we want to drink. Sometimes, not even while we're hungry. In fact, most of the times, not when we're hungry. We're really the only species that does that. Other animals, other creatures only eat when they're hungry. For survival. Humans are the only ones that eat for taste and pleasure. So in this case, we actually do need to be more animalistic and actually less desire. The point being is, is that the Ramban is telling us that we can attain holiness, a certain aspect of it, through food. If we eat food which are proper and balanced between hot and cold, as we discussed in the previous lectures, the ones that we mentioned today, food that will produce pure, clean blood, meaning food that's kosher, if it's healthy and kosher, it's a plus, because this food will eventually turn into seed. This food will turn into something bigger than what anybody expects when they're a little kid. Now, this food can turn into a baby. But even if it doesn't turn into a baby, the seed that's within a person's body is the highest level of, of uh, his essence, of a person's essence. And as we saw, someone that is wasting seed or promiscuous, or even if they're intimate with their, their, their own uh, spouse, but too much, it could hurt their brain because part of it is created by the brain. Now, if a person is eating dirty food, whatever he's producing is not good either. So there's a double negative. It doesn't turn into a positive. It's not good or right for them to, or permitted for them to waste seed just because they're producing filthy, putrid seed because they're eating filthy, putrid uh, uh, food. But the point being is, is that if a person at least tries to eat better food, he's going to produce better seed that could produce better babies, healthier babies, spiritually and physically. But even if it, without the babies, he himself will become healthier spiritually and physically. Now, the Ramban says that this type of thing can actually affect whether the fetus is wise, foolish, righteous, or wicked. So from the surface, it seems like, wait, are we, take, are we making the choices of whether our kids are going to be righteous or not? No. The Gemara in Masechet Nida, page 16, says that an angel takes each seed to a Kadosh Baruch Hu, to the Creator and says, what will be with the seed? Will it be righteous, wicked, rich, poor, tall, short? What will be his lifetime? Will he ever get married? Will it be a she? What will be with the seed? So this does not mean that Hashem determines everything for them because the following few words in the Gemara says that everything, whether you're rich, poor, alive, long life, short life, tall, short, beautiful, ugly, all of these things are from heaven, decided by heaven, except the fear of heaven as far as whether he'll be righteous or wicked. So how do we explain what the Ramban is saying about whether he'll be righteous or wicked? Simple. The cleaner, purer food produces cleaner, purer blood, which produces cleaner, purer seed, which produces cleaner, purer character traits, better inclinations, whereas the bad food, the filthy food, the forbidden food, creates filthier blood, filthier seed, Filthier character traits, problems, arrogance, stinginess, heretical thoughts and beliefs, all types of things that 
make it difficult to serve the Creator and fulfill your purpose. The Gemara in Masechet Shabbat, page 156a, says that a person that's born on Tuesday will have an inclination to be wealthy since he was created on the same day that the grass was created, which grass continued to grow, to conquer more land. So does that mean that every person that's born on Tuesday is going to be wealthy? No. But rather that the person that's born on Tuesday will have inclinations that they can use that others don't necessarily have, which will help them become wealthy. If a person comes from parents that don't care about holiness, the person will have inclinations that other people don't have, but they're not necessarily going to be good ones. If a person comes from parents that do care about holiness, that person will also have things that other people don't have, which will actually make him better a person. They'll be more humble, they'll be more inclined to learn, more inclined to do good things. So then we have to answer the final question that we asked in the beginning. We're talking about intimacy. We're talking about bringing a child to the world. Many people have merited to have many children and are beyond those years. Some are still looking forward for the next one. Others are crying to Hashem, waiting for the first one. But everyone knows that kids, when they're born, they're loved. They're adored. Before they said hello, before they said, I love you. Before they did anything good, they're already born loved. Now what's a mom to expect? What's the father to expect? As we said, expect dirty diapers, expect sleepless nights, expect no compliments, expect a lot of waste, crying, bickering, expect that. So why do you love this thing that is so small? There's a lot of things that are small. Why do you love this baby? The more we delve into this series, the more we realize why we love our babies. Because the baby is us. It's you, mamash. It's you. It's not just, oh, the husband was with the wife and the seed, it, 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 you know, it, it, it goes and the egg and air. No, no, no. It's the essence of you, the essence of your wife, the essence of the two people, the best of you, the worst of you, is what comes out. So it's not that you love the kid because of the diapers or the smallness. No, no. It's that it's you. And if you really want to love your kids even more, listen to the Ramban. Because that means you'll invest even more to create a better you. And a better you will create a better baby version of you which will be a lot more lovable because the more you invest into something the more you love it Bezat Hashem this too will help each and every single one of us not only love our babies the ones that we have the ones that Bezat Hashem will get blessed with but also it's going to help us simply have more inclination and desire to do better with ourselves, with our lives. We're all here. We all have tools from the Holy Torah that we could apply, that we could use to better our life. At the very least, let's not ruin it. There's a lot of things the Ramban is warning us about more than he's telling us about things to do. Because as David HaMelech says, Sur mirav Run away from evil and then do good. 
It's a common denominator among all holy writings where the warning from evil is primary over the delving into the good. Because so long as you don't do evil, even if you don't delve into much good, you'll still be okay. But if you delve into the evil, even much good could be ruined. So the food, the diets, the holy guidance is certainly something all of us have to take into account. Perhaps you can share some ingredients or some dishes if you want on the Facebook page. Share it with others if you try it. Share it with others if you enjoy it. Share it with others if it was horrible. But encourage each other. Because at the end of it all, it's a small world. Everybody's looking for something better. That better is within us if we simply listen to the instructions of the sages. B'chabat Hashem, we'll learn again tomorrow. Thank you.